Okay, welcome everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to welcome Petro Vieira today from the Permeter Institute. Petro is very well known for integrability in supersymmetric theories, and uh, that's also precisely the topic today, namely integrability in ADS-CFT, mm -hmm. uh, which is a talk in uh, the quantum aspects of space-time and matter seminar series. So please, uh, Petro, uh, take it away. Okay. Ah. So thank you, and uh, let's try to keep it as informal as possible. If people could turn on their cameras, at least some people, I, I think it's always more fun to so that I can see people and uh, interrupt me at any moment and uh, ask me any kind of question. So I'll try to keep it as informal as possible and tell you a little bit about some advances in this field, which is called integrability in ads -CFT. So. Let me just remind you that integrability is uh, a property that typically that sometimes shows up in one dimensional system or in one plus one dimensional system, right? So if I have the space of say quantum field theories, right? Then there would be a subspace which would be one plus one dimensional quantum field theory. And then inside that space, there would be the space of integrable theory. So integrable theories are particular theories, typically, I mean, usually in one plus one dimensions, where we somehow have this blessing of exact solvability. Okay. Now, I will tell you a little bit about the precise definition of integrability, but uh, I just want to emphasize that normally it's a property of some one dimensional theories. And so people that study, say, condensed matter, sometimes they find some one dimensional materials, some materials that are effectively one dimensional that they are lucky enough that they are exactly solvable, they are integrable. Or sometimes in high energy physics, in some situations, I would say in two situations, we can have this integrability. One, when the physics is effectively lower dimensional. For example, when you scatter at very high energy and there is some scattering plane that matters and what happens in some transverse per lane is not very important or some situation like that where effectively, even though we are in higher dimensions, things are happening in two dimensions, in one plus one. And therefore we can imagine sometimes getting integrability even in higher dimensions. Or in ADS-CFT, when we are dealing with string theory, strings are if after all a one dimensional object, right? If I have a string, a small loop of energy, it's also a one dimensional object. And so if we are lucky, we could have integrability even with, um, even uh, in, higher, in higher dimensions through string theory. Now, in part, integrability has been helpful in understanding, uh, as I said, ADS-CFT. And uh, just to set the stage, let us then uh, uh, see where we are and where we would like to go. So let's suppose we are studying um, n equals four superion yields or strings in ADS5 times S5, they would be dual to each other as you probably heard. And the starting point say of studying quantum field theory would be say Feynman diagrams. Right, so I start with Feynman diagrams and that's what we learn in quantum field theory books. Now, where do I want to go? What's the goal? The goal is to have a solution of a uh, strongly coupled four-dimensional gauge theory, right? So I want a book. Uh, this is a drawing of a book. Right? So there are maybe many pages, I don't know, some pages at least, of a book that describes the solution of a four-dimensional gauge theory. Now, it's a long way, starting from Feynman diagrams till having the first solution of a four-dimensional gauge theory at finite coupling that we can look at and stare at and try to draw conclusions. And it's a long path and I want to divide it. I want to 
have some milestone in the middle that we can say, okay, we are halfway, or at least this is a nice result that uh, we can, uh, that we can, um, th this is already a nice result. Let's try to understand uh, how do we get there and how do we advance from there. So there is a result here that I want to tell you about, which is what is called the octagon. And the octagon is a particular powerful result in n equals four to three and meals. I will tell you what the definition is, and then I will tell you what it is equal to. So let's postpone this a little bit. But I want to say that this octagon, it's not the solution of this gauge theory, that is, which is what we want to do at the end, but it's an exact result in this gauge theory. And it's an exact result in this gauge theory for a very non-trivial quantity. So it, it's, it's great that we have this result. And so I would say, I would separate this exploration into what would be, what do we do after we have the octagon? So post octagon, and how do we get to the octagon? And so we have this pre-octagon, we have this post-octagon. And, and this is an exact, uh, this is this an exact octagon result. This will in... be an exact result. I will tell you the definition and the result. Okay. So this is, I will propose to start this lecture. We will start here. I will start by telling you what is this octagon, what's the definition and what is it equal to? Just so we have a, a milestone, a result to, ha to hang uh, our head to, to, to grip. Then I will uh, tell you a little bit, how did we get there? And then I'll spend a few, some time telling you how could we go beyond that in the quest of uh, starting from the, in this quest for the, the solution to a quantum field theory. Okay, so, okay. Um, now, uh, again, as I said in the very beginning, I'm not sure how much time I had when uh, originally I was told to give this lecture, I was told it was like two or three hours to explain a little bit what this business of integrability in EDSCFT is. Since it's a very small crowd and very informal, let's see for how long people keep asking questions. So do ask questions. When I see that the questions are fading away, we'll stop. And uh, I assume this is, a, this is a good plan. So please, uh, the goal is for uh, you to ask questions. And uh, so I can tell you a little bit about this huge field. And um, I will try to center things about around this recent result, which is called the octagon which is the result due to, um, not due to me, but due to Frank Coronado. Maybe let, let me ask directly in this context, um, the, the gauge theories in this context, uh, it doesn't matter if it's abelian or non-abelian, non uh, I assume. Or, yeah, we would love to have a solution of an interesting four-dimensional gauge theory, something which is strongly coupled, something that is non-trivial. So let's, let's say it's an unabelian gauge theory. And uh, the one that we will solve will be N equals four super young mills, which is a particular supersymmetric young mills theory with lots of symmetry. And that's the theory that uh, we will aim at. That's the theory that is simple enough that we might hope to solve it, but rich enough that we want to solve. Okay. So, so any question about um, uh, about the plan? <clears throat> so, if there is no question, let me tell you what is this octagon and what is it. So, I'll tell you without any derivation. I want to write this this result. So, I'll tell you what uh, what physical quantity it is. And what is it equal to? Okay, so this octagon O is a four point function in this n equals four super Young Mills theory. Okay, 
And so let's define it. And at the same time as we define it, motivate it. So n equals four super young meal, this theory here is a four dimensional conformal non abelian supersymmetric gauge theory, right? So roughly it is uh, given by it's Lagrangian would be one over G and mil square, like quantum chromodynamics, trace of F square, plus other matter that makes it into max into a theory which is maximally supersymmetric. Okay. So fermions and a, a bunch of scalars and so on. Of course, in the real world, we would love to solve right, this theory. This would be the Lagrangian of pure glue. This is too complicated. We have no hopes right now. We don't have tools for solving pure glue. So we try to solve this n equals four super young mu, which uh, would be uh, like our, the analog of the two dimensionalizing models for quantum field theories. The theory that we would like to solve, hoping that by solving this theory, we learn important lessons about general field theory. Okay. <clears throat> so in this theory, in n equals four super young mu's, we have infinitely many operators we can consider, right? There are many operators. And so when I say four point function, when I say correlation function of operators, what operators are we considering? Okay. So there is the stress tensor, there is trace of F squared, it's an operator. There is trace of f to the four, it's another operator. There are infinitely many operators you can consider out of the fields of this non abelian gauge theory, right? So it's, it's just a very complicated field. And uh, the simplest operators are operators like the following like uh, uh, O, let's say, and let's let me use another letter. This looks like the octagon. The simplest would be, for example, trace of one of them, one of the complex scalars of the theory. So this Z is a complex scalar. And uh, it's inserted. And now we can have, say, uh, K of them inserted all of them at some position x1 say okay so let me say a few words about this operator a question good do ask questions uh, are, are these operators all inserted at the same point right so let, let's make a few so good ask me all, all these questions so that i can see where i go so why am i inserting them all at the same point they are indeed inserted all at the same point as i wrote so why so in this non-abelian let's emphasize what does it mean that the gauge theory is non-abelian non-abelian means that under a gauge transformation our field, for example, our fundamental scalar Z at some position X transforms into a rotation, a, a local gauge transformation at position X, then the field at position X, and then the conjugate, which is the inverse at position X. That's a gauge transformation. It rotates every field by any parameter. And therefore you see that because of that, when I multiply many fields, right, z to the k transforms in the same way if they are all at the same position, right? Because then the u, u minus one just cancel and I get a u and a u minus one only at the end, right? No, I, I, z times z. No, I understand that, but like, um, I mean, um, w wouldn't it make more sense to have it at different points and then connect the 
insertion at each point with a holonomy along a path we could also do that so but let let me uh, let me emphasize first that the reason why we construct operators at the same point so now when i have many of them they still transform in the same way and then when we take the trace of this operator what happens is that by taking the trace it just goes under the trace right under the trace this u and u minus one just drop because of cyclicity of the trace and so these operators are what are called gauge invariant operators which are what are good physical operators they don't depend on any gauge gauge invariant physical operator and here i would add a key word which is local so these are our local probes right now you the ones you are saying are also gauge invariant but they are not local they would be take a point connect them by a holonomy take another point connect them by an anonymy take another point until you close into some kind of necklace so that's good right. that's a good operator it's it's gauge invariant indeed it doesn't depend on your gauge it's well defined but it's a much more complicated ob object, right? Because it's non-local, it depends on many points and it depends on the path that you use to connect the various points with holonomies. So this type of operators in non-abelian gauge theories where you just multiply fields at the same point and then take the trace are a basis and they are the simplest possible basis of local gauge invariant operators. Okay. But may, may I ask uh, one more question? Of course, yeah. The more questions, uh, the better. Yeah, uh, well, uh, this is connected with the previous question. I still don't understand because usually such products in one point are not well defined if you start to do right Feynman diagrams. You, you need basically to do some uh, renormalization and then to take uh, in the, the limit. Beautiful. That's the way that you say, say in this way you get, can get some anomaly and so on so wh why these operators are well defined if you uh, okay. take the right point great question okay so like, let's go there a little bit okay so as you point out now <clears throat> normally we have to renormalize so let's explain this in some detail so, <clears throat> so we have many fields. Uh, in fact, for example, I said that we have a complex scalar Z, but for example, for example, just about scalars, we have uh, six scalars. Each of them is a UN matrix, right? So we have six scalars, phi one, phi two, dot, 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 up to phi six. And this complex scalar Z that I defined before is just a combination phi one plus I phi two. Okay? Yeah. Now, then uh, out of these many, many fields that we have, we can consider out of these fields, we can consider operators, gauge invariant operators, operators, that would be words made out of this field. So for example, I can make trace of Z to the K, that's one word where I just do, or more generally, I could consider trace and I use one scalar with index I1, another scalar with index I2, dot, 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 and finally a scalar with index IL, and I make a linear combination of these guys with some wave function psi with indices I1 up to IL. And this will define me an operator O. And because I take a different, I can take different linear combinations, this operator is inserted at some position X. But because I have different linear combinations, I will put an index here that indicates which linear combination I consider. And I will add here on top, I will write bare for reasons that will become clear now because this will be before the normalization. Now, already let me open a parenthesis here and note something nice. That 
you see that because we are dealing with an anabelian gauge field, gauge theory, that's what anabelian means. I multiply many fields, and here the order matters. Right? Phi i1 times phi i2 is not the same as phi i2 times phi i1. But I, so it's like this here, this immediately defines a one dimensional, this defines a one dimensional spin chain. Here immediately, I can think of this guy as being a spin chain of length L, where I have one spin, which is a spin parameterized by this index I1, a spin parameterized by I2, etc until the last one, which is a spin parameterized by IL, right? Just notation, I just, this is equivalent to a cat where I have spin I1 up to spin IL. It's just notation. And then I make a linear combination. So this operator O would be the same as a state in the spin chain. So immediately our operators are in one-to-one -one correspondence with spin chain in an abelian gauge theory. That's always true. Now, as you point out, in general, these operators will have uh, to be renormalized. So what does it mean? So let's take this operator. Let me copy it to the next page. And uh, and let's see what does it mean that it needs to be normalized. Let's just say, okay, I take an operator, I consider it, right? And now let's encounter what you said. So now we start doing Feynman diagrams and we start computing. Let's compute a correlation function of one spin chain A with one spin chain B. Okay. Yeah. Or more precisely, let this OA and OB stand for this part here now. So let's consider this guy and a similar one. So, uh, so let A stand now for this collection of indices here. So for all this collection of indices, this is what A is. Now, when we start doing these Feynman diagrams, this operator, before I do, I consider any quantum effects, any anomalies, like you are saying, this operator, remember, we are in four dimensions, so the scalar is dimension one. So this operator, to leading order, if I consider it in perturbation theory, I just have my operator A, which is a product of L fields. So one up to L. I have my operator B, which is a product of L fields. And to leaving order before quantum effects, I just connect them by propagators. I just do weak contractions, right? The theory would be free. And each propagator is equal to just, it's a conformal theory. So the propagator is one over X minus Y square, right? It's a propagator between two scalars, each of dimension one. So the propagator has dimension two. The only thing it can be is one over X minus Y squared. And we have L propagators and therefore we get X minus Y to the power two L. Okay. And then uh, we would say that furthermore, this index here must be the same as this one here. This index here must be the same as this one here, etc. So there will be a delta AB. Now, this first result, before I close the bracket, would be what you expect in a conformal field theory if you have a two point function of operators, each of them of dimension L, which is the dimension of the operator, one plus one plus one plus one L times. But at the quantum level, these operators, they're classical dimension, which is L can be corrected and you can get a quantum, a shift in the dimension of the operator. Instead of being just an integer, it will typically be quantum correct. Okay, but how do we see this in a very explicit term? We see that if now we start doing Feynman diagrams, 
I start doing loops. So I start doing loops and I start, for example, I, I drew here an exchange of a gluon. And now when we start doing loops, we see that there are divergences. So now I see that plus at one loop, there will be lambda. Lambda is going to be the coupling. And then there will be some divergence that depends on which operator A I use and which operator B I have. It depends on, depending on two operators, the Feynman diagram gives me a different divergence. And this divergence will be proportional to what? Will be proportional to the logarithm of some cutoff that I introduce. This would have dimensions of inverse length, some very small, uh, some very big cutoff because the inverse length would be very small. And then to make it dimensionless, I multiply by the only distance I have in this CFT, which is X minus Y. Okay, so let, let's put here square, square. Plus dot, 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 and dot, dot, dot stand for higher loops. So this would be at one loop, just so we see what starts to happen. And now, as you point out, this is divergent. So this is not well defined. This operator, I start defining this operator and the result is infinity. This is a cutoff. Okay. Okay, but this is this we know how to do. So this just means that these operators are the bare operators and I need to renormalize the operators. Okay. So let's do it. So the, the way we do it is the following. We say that this gamma AB is equivalent to saying that I have a matrix gamma. Right? This hat stands for a matrix. Right? And this matrix, it acts on a spin chain and it gives another spin chain. Right? It's an, it has two indices, A and B. So this matrix is nothing but a spin chain Hamiltonian. It's an operator that acts on a spin chain and gives me another spin chain. So this is a spin chain Hamiltonian. Right? Do you yeah. agree? Now, this spin chain Hamiltonian and this OA is a spin chain vector, right? So this is a, a cat. And now let's diagonalize this spin chain Hamiltonian. Okay. Let's consider O renormalized. Let's, let's define it like this. Let's say that O renormalized is a combination psi A, O, A, bare where by doing this combination, this combination is done to diagonalize this Hamiltonian, the Hamiltonian with eigenvalue gamma. This eigenvalue in the spin chain language would be the energy of the spin chain. Yeah. Now, if I do it, if I just do that, then what happens is that here, right? What would we get in this, in this here? Let's copy this. And let's see how this formula now would be corrected when I consider this nice combination that diagonalized the Hamiltonian. So what would happen here is that now that we diagonalize this Hamiltonian, erase this. Now, because it's diagonalized, I can just put the Delta AB here, right? And replace this eigenvalue by the number, which is the eigen, the corresponding eigenvalue. And I get something like this. Right? Yeah. And this stuff is what? 
this is nothing. Okay, let me fix, put a minus sign here and fix a minus sign here, sorry. This is definition. And now this is nothing, but you see what this, what, how nice this is. This is nothing but lambda times X minus Y to the power minus two lambda gamma plus dot, dot, dot. If I expand now in small lambda, I reproduce the previous line. And now you see what happens. What this does is this lambda here now, I don't like, but it's fine now it's multiplicative. I will pass it here. So let's do that. Let's define this by putting a lambda here. There are two powers to a single power, gamma times gamma times this. And now this operator here renormalized has the property that if I have a renormalized operator with another renormalized operator, their correlation function is one over X minus Y to the power two Delta, where Delta is what? Is the bare dimension L. This would be the bare or classical dimension plus Lambda times Gamma. And this would be a one loop quantum correction. And then plus order lambda square, which will be two loops and so on. Yeah. And so the final punchline is that the operators I should really consider, as you correctly point out, are these operators. These ones are well defined. They have precise quantum dimension, and this would be our basis of local operators. Okay. Yeah. Now, I did not lie in what I wrote because there are operators that have eigenvalue zero, that have zero energy for this spin chain. And those operators, this factor that I added is just one. Right? So these are operators that the classical dimension is not corrected, that don't have anomalies. And that's why they are the simplest. And that's why I said that the simplest ones are this, okay? But yeah. Let me maybe make that precise because I know that uh, some people here work with one dimensional spin chain. So I think it might be nice. So if we did all this work, we see that right now we have, so first we start with an anabelian gauge theory. And then we go to these spin chain states. And this is just notation, right? This is nothing deep. We also go to a spin chain Hamiltonian H, which is a spin chain Hamiltonian. And here, to do it, what do I need to compute? Again, I remind you, you just need to compute the one loop diagrams, see how they diverge. And the coefficient of the divergence is the Hamiltonian. So you read it off. So here we read this off by doing Feynman diagrams. So that's exactly what I said in the very beginning. So that's the beginning of any study of quantum field theory. We do Feynman diagrams and we find the Hamiltonian. By, by that procedure, uh, can you give some properties of this Hamiltonian? So I guess you can't one cannot say that it is a critical Hamiltonian or something like oh, we can compute it and we can see what it is so we more than no properties we can write it down so let me write it down so let, let's write it down what it is so again the Hilbert space so let's first write what's the Hilbert space it will act on the Hilbert space remember we had six scalars we are in this subsector of scalars so each scalar there are six options. So it would be a C6, right? And how many of these scalars we have? We have L, so the Hilbert space would be C6 L times, right? C6, 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 C6. C6. So it's, it's a funny spin chain, it's, it's what is called an SO6 spin chain. And most people typically work with SU2 spin chains where you have spin up and spin down. 
But here we have instead an O6 vector at each point, but that's not a big deal. It's just a small difference. So it's an SO6 spin chain. Now, when you have an SU2 spin chain with spin one half, there are two things you can do to spin, project it into symmetric or project it into anti-symmetric if you have a nearest neighbor Hamiltonian. When you have an SO6, there are three tensor structures you can construct. Because you can, uh, if you think in terms of Kronecker delta, of delta AB, delta CD, there are three Kronecker deltas you can consider. Or if you think in terms of group theory, if you multiply two vector representations, there are three irreducible representations you can construct. And so an, a spin chain Hamiltonian for nearest neighbors that interacts the neighbors of the spin chain with SO6 symmetry is always of the following form. You sum, let's suppose we sum from I equal one up to L, that's the size of the spin chain. And now we have some Hamiltonian density that acts on spin I and I plus one. What is it? It's given by a number that I will normalize with the number here so that I say there is an identity that does nothing. It just acts on two spins and gives the same spins. There is a term uh, which would be a permutation times some number A. And this permutation would take the spins and just flip them. So if this is I, this becomes I. And if it's J, this becomes J at the position I have plus one. And there is another coefficient B times another structure, which is trace, which just identifies this index that gives one if these indices are equal. And it produces two indices that are equal. This last structure K is the one that you don't have in SU2. In SU2, you either take the spins and you permute them or don't permute them. But here, because it's an SO6 spin chain, you have this extra new structure, which is called the trace. And this is the Hamiltonian you get. OK. Now, uh, and furthermore, um, yeah, go on. Someone wants to ask a question, yeah? Yeah, so, so, so you need, uh, you have its own Hamiltonian for each operator? No, no. This operator you compute once and for all. It's a matrix, A, B, and you just compute it. So this is the Hamiltonian matrix that we need to compute. Now you diagonalize this matrix, you solve this Hamiltonian, you diagonalize it, and uh, the various eigenvectors are the various operators. The various eigenvalues are the various dimensions. Now you have one operator for each length. So that the length you fix. So you say, I, have, I want to consider local operators of length 10. Then this Hamiltonian is a sum from I equal one up to 10. And this is a huge Hilbert space. There are many operators, right? There are six to the 10 operators, right? It's a big Hilbert space. So there are many operators. Question? Uh, now. Yeah. So, so how do I see that Hamiltonian's nearest neighbor? Great question. OK. Uh, the, so why is the Hamiltonian nearest neighbor? So we got some Hamiltonian. And I wrote immediately, here is the Hamiltonian, its nearest neighbor. And it, by symmetry, it must be this. So, so the questions we ask now are, question, why nearest neighbor? Why is it local? In other words, why is this H local in the spin chain? And then a more technical question, question prime, what is this A and B, these parameters of the Hamiltonian? Right? I just said that by symmetry, it must be something like this. But what is this A and B? And this A and B are fixed by the Feynman diagrams. In principle, these guys are the outcomes of computing the one loop Feynman diagram. But what is the result? Now, the reason why it's local, it's true in any non-abelian gauge theory. It's related, this is related to a limit we are going to take, which is large n, large number of colors. 
So if you remember when I said that Z transforms under U, Z, U minus one, I remind you that this Z is an N by N matrix. And this U is a UN gauge transformation. So, don't, don't, so let's not be confused. Let me just emphasize that phi, there are these scalars. This Z is just a combination of two scalars, phi one plus I phi two. So this scalar has two types of indices. One is which type of scalar it is, it runs from one to N, but the scalar itself is a UN times UN. It's in the adjoint of UN. So it has two indices, A and B. And these indices run from one to N. And it's because they are matrices that multiplying them, the order matters, and that's why we have a spin chain. And so this guy, we draw it like this. When we draw a picture, we say that there is an index A, and then there is an index B. And this is what is called a double line notation. So we use two lines for each operator because each operator has two indices. It's a matrix. Now, that means that when we multiply many operators to bail, trace a phi with index I1, tac, 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 phi index IL, let's draw it. So what is this? This is literally, let me write it. It's a sum, each operator, phi I1 comes within this AB. Sorry, one sec, let me just finish this. Phi I2 with index BC, dot, 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 et cetera. Yes? Uh could you just uh, clash the last uh, slide that you wrote down? I, uh, uh, yeah, thanks a lot. So this would be this sum. So how would we draw this picture? We would say that there is an operator of type I1 with index A and B. And then there is an operator of type I2 with, and you say the index is the same, it's nice, this line is the same, with B and C, and then there is an operator I3 with index C and D, etc. And this, then you have this, and then at the end it closes, the first and last index are the same. Right? So this is nothing but the spin chain. Right? It's a spin chain where you have a bunch of operators multiplied one after the other. And each Spin chain size comes with a label of what spin you have. Okay, and then uh, we start drawing Feynman diagrams. For example, when we say that when I drew something like phi one, a phi at some position with a phi at some other position, and I wrote the propagator just with a line, right? Now in double line notation that we use in unabelian gauge theories. If we are a little bit more, more careful, we say that, well, more precisely, each operator has double line, and I should draw a fat propagator that connects between the two. Right? This would be a more rigorous pick. Right? And what you would write more precisely is that the formula we will, you would write is the following. You would say the correlation function of phi with index i and index a, b with phi with index J and index C, D. If you see the picture, if this is A and B, and this would be C and D, you see that the indices delta A needs to be equal to D, B needs to be equal to C. Then there is a propagator X minus Y square, and of course I and J also need to be. So this is the propagator being more precise about all the ins. Okay. And now we have large N and large N means the following. It means that when we start doing Feynman diagrams and when we start connecting to leading order, we just connect the two operators and each operator is a spin chain and we just connect and let's draw three sites only or let's draw four sites. And to leading order, we draw this, right? And then this is operator at the top. This is a spin chain at the top. The spin chain at the bottom 
is this one. And you see that F after I contract, right? I just get these propagators L times. Okay. And now uh, let's start doing our Feynman diagrams and let's do a loop. And let's Can do I a loop. A question. Yes. Uh, so just a question about the note. I'm a little, I'm a little confused about the, the notation. Uh, mm -hmm. So it basically looks like a matrix product state, right? And the way you're writing down, and this this is the matrix product operator. Not yet. No, I I don't. I would not say that. No. Um, but let me see why you think so. so. We can discuss connection with matrix product sets right now. No, I, I would not say so. There are there is an index i one, an index i two that I'm not discussing now. I three, and i four. And here there is an index J1, J2, J3, and J4. And because they are connected, this is proportional to I1 needs to be equal to J1, I2 needs to be equal to J2, etc., and IL needs to be equal to JL. And this big thing here is what before I was just denoting saying spin chain A needs to be equal to spin chain B. And so this is just, I have a state at the top, step at the bottom, and top, they need to be the same. No, my, my question was about the, I mean, if you don't mind, if I'm not asking too many questions. No, the more questions, the better. As I said, when there are no questions, I'll stop. While there are questions, I'll the, Then can you go back to the last uh, slide? Yes. Uh, so in the picture that you have drawn here of uh, uh, A, B, B, C, C, D, right? And um, so the way the way I look at the uh, the term in the product, so it says phi one i one a b times phi i two b c, right? Yeah. So and I and I compare that with the with the picture that you have drawn, then I think of the b in the first term being contracted with the b in the second term. Exactly. So it's how you multiply matrices, right? So right. This right. is equal. This is equal to this, which is equal to right. So then my question is that, then where are the two remaining free ends coming from? Right, I mean, you have, you have drawn it like this, that each node, it has two ends going up like this and two ends off to the side. The legs that go, uh, the legs that are, uh, so. Okay, maybe, maybe I'm, no, 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 that, actually other. that's a good, good question. So this guy, the picture I draw is this. And this right. picture indicates that uh, this guy, this is what's important. It has two indices, one A and one B. Mm -hmm. This guy is this picture here. It has an index B and an index C. Mm -hmm. But the index B of this guy is the same as the one of this guy. Right. So to indicate that, I connect them by a line to indicate they are, sure. not, they are not independent, they are the same. Sure. That's it. Right. Uh, okay. And that, then my question is that then in the next page, when you when you connect the two different spin chains. Yeah. So so this is the connection. Okay, this is the connection between the between the I's and J's. Okay. Yes. Okay. All right. Right. Got so it. Let, let's emphasize that this picture, the, the 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 kind of picture we learn in quantum field theory, when I consider a correlation function of pi to the fourth. How would we normally write this if it was not an Annabelian gauge theory? It was a usual quantum field theory. You would draw, instead of putting this big chain, you would put a point. Because remember, all these guys are at some position Y and all these guys are at some position X. So we made them big to see the index, but they are all at the same point, right? So we would draw a point for the top, a point for the bottom. Then we would say that there are four scalars getting out of this. This is pi to the fourth. There are four scalars getting out here, right? That's how we learn quantum field theory, pi to the four. And then I do with contractions. I just connect them by propagators and I will just draw propagators between the two. Um, right? Sorry. Uh, all, all these indices are the indices of a joint uh, in four scala in the previous uh, slide. 
Are they all in the, uh, of a joint? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And this is a, a connection in large N theories. Usually, when you substitute gluon by two quarks, you also write such uh, double lines. A quark normally in an, in a, if the quark is in the fundamental, we use yeah. a single line for the quark, right? Because then the yeah. quark only has one index, a, right? Like in the real world. But uh, uh, in any close force supreme mills, our matter, the analog of the quarks, would be say the scalars and similar fermions, they have two indices, so they are matrices. Oh, I see. So, so it's like the matter, the gluon in the real world has two indices, right? There are eight gluons. Eight is n squared minus one, so n is, is uh, so, so our gluons in the real world have two indices, but our quarks have one index. Here, everyone has two indices. So the gluons have two indices, the scalars have two indices, the fermions have two indices, everyone has two indices. So why is everyone so similar? Because of supersymmetry, because supersymmetry relates all of them. So it could not be that the gluons had two indices and the quarks had one index and so on, like in the real world, because we are dealing with a more symmetric group. So everyone has, is on the same footing. Everyone is a matrix, which is nice because then we have this pin chain picture. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. So now let's say that okay, but there is a constant of proportionality when I just connect this. That you see that the index is the same along the yellow line, right? So this index that I I if I follow the index here, it's the same here, it's the same here, and it's the same here, right? But which one it is? Which index is it? It's the same, but what index is it? One, two, three, four, five. Well, it can be any, and I have to sum over, right? When I multiply. And so this diagram here is proportional to, because of this loop of index, there is a factor of n here, because there is a loop of index here. And there is another loop here of index, another one, a neighboring here. And that comes with another power of n. And there is another one here. And finally, there is one here in the back of the cylinder, n. And so this example of this diagram, this diagram is proportional to n to the power l, where l is the size of the spin chain. Do you agree? Yeah. Now, when we do weak contractions, we could connect them like this. But we could have considered, and let me draw it in a different color, and I hope it's not confusing because I don't want to write everything again. We could have connected the operators in a different way. So we could have connected, let me draw it in dashed line and in blue. Suppose I connect this operator, let's say like this. Uh, maybe let me even draw something. No, I don't need to draw this, sorry, let me take that. Oops. Okay, I'll, I'll draw it again in the bottom. Too. So let's copy. So this diagram was proportional to n to the L that I can absorb in the normalization of the operator. But let's consider a different possible contraction where I do like this. I contract like this. And now I will contract this guy with this oper other operator. And then this one, I contract with this operator. And then here I contract the same thing, etc. So what I did is I swapped this guy, right? And now, okay, and uh, let's say we close it here like before. So this would mean that index I1 is equal to index J1, but index I2 is now equal to index J3, and index I3 is equal to J2, right? And index I4 is equal to J4, okay? And now, what is this diagram proportional to, this other weak contraction? Remember that if it was non-abelian, if it was a usual phi to the four, we would not distinguish this, right? In phi to the four, this is the only diagram I have normally, right? I just draw this and I don't start putting lines and indicating how they are. 
because order doesn't matter. Five to the four is five to the four. But here the order matters. So I have to distinguish these two diagrams. These are two different contractions, right? So I remind you that when we learn quantum field theory, we normalize the vertex of five to the four, we divide by four factorial, precisely so that when we count all these weak contractions, this four factorial drops and we get one, right? But here, the different orders matter, the different ways we reconnect using weak contractions. And let's see how this diagram would scale with n, assuming n is large. So now let's follow the color n and let's see. So this index is the same as this, right? Can you see? Follow, follow. Okay, I'll, I'll follow with a pen. So follow like this. So this index, can you see what I'm writing? Let's see. So this one here, okay. So this index here is you follow it here, it goes here, it goes here, it goes here. This is the same as before, is this outside one here up, up, up here, right? So that gives a power of n. But then uh, here we have one, two, three loops of n. And look what happens here. I start here, I go 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 here. Single loop of n. So this diagram is proportional to n to the L minus two. I have two less loops of n. Right? Yeah. And so you see that this diagram is much smaller than this one. And so what did what happened was that the spin chain immediately I gained some notion of locality. One wants to be connected with one, two with two, three with three. Because if I start connecting things far away, this is suppressed when n is large. And so what happens is that uh, when we take an unabelian gauge theory and then when we take n to infinity, what, what happens? We get locality. Okay. The diagrams that are not local are suppressed. And what does it mean more precisely? This arrow. So it means that at three level, that is at classical level before doing loops, at three level, we identify I1 with J1, I2 with J2, etc. And what about at loop level? Well, at loop level, now if I start drawing my loops, now it's not true that one only talks to one and two only talks to two and three only talks to three and so on. And here I have the bottom. Now I have to start doing loops. I start to have interaction. And now I could imagine, for example, an aquatic interaction that I could draw here, for example. This would be a vertex. This would be inserting a quartic vertex. Right? This would be an analog of a five to the four interaction. And I would insert it there. And the rest, I do nothing. And this was proportional to lambda, to this coupling lambda. Now, what would it do? What would this coupling do? Now we see that I1 still needs to be equal to J1. Uh, JL still needs to be equal to IL. But here at position I and at position I plus one, right? And here at position J and position J plus one. Now here, there is a local Hamiltonian gamma that acts, that can shuffle around the indices at position i and i plus one. Now, what is this precise Hamiltonian? Well, now it depends on the quartic vertex, on how the quartic vertex reconnects the index i, j, k, l, right? So that would depend. I would have to write down for you what the quartic vertex is so that you can read it up. And the details of this kind of interactions so what we learn here is that it needs to be nearest neighbor because if it's not nearest neighbor, it will be suppressed in N. So if instead of doing it local, if I start crossing lines below, it's not nearest neighbor. And we also learn what is A and B. It is just encoded in the details of the quartic vertex and we can read it up. Okay, so it was... Uh, yeah. 
so I do, to get a new Hamiltonian now uh, in the large n limit, is that the conclusion that you want to? That, so in the large n limit, we get the nearest neighbor Hamilton. And um, so every eigenvector uh, corresponds to an operator. Do I understand that? That's right. So, so we take n to infinity, then we get a local nearest neighbor Hamiltonian. What do we do with this Hamiltonian? We compute its eigenstates. And these eigenstates are the good operators of the theory. And we compute the corresponding eigen energies. And these eigen energies are the dimensions of the operator. Okay. Can you explain again why is it local? And then goes to infinity limit. Because so here I drew an example of a local interaction. Yeah. And one that would be not local, if I use, uh, if I try to draw one which is non local, like for example, suppose I have another operator here and I connect this line there instead. By the same reason as what we did at three level, if I start counting loops of n, I see that I miss loops. So local stuff maximizes these color loops, these powers of n that you generate. So when you take L to infinity, if you want to maximize the number of faces that you have, the number of such loops, this gives a power n, this one gives a power n, and so on. This one here, another loop here gives a power n. So if you want to keep only the leading power of n, you cannot draw non-local stuff because non-local stuff have less loops of n. Uh, question. Uh, but uh, when you say local and non-local, uh, it's not clear which uh, space you're talking about because uh, the top part is all at one point X and the bottom part is all at one point Y, right? Okay, yeah. So, so here, you we, have to have, we have to have in mind that uh, we are already, so we start, so the spin chain, right? The position X of the spin chain plays no role in this discussion. We, even though it's a point X, at that point X, there is a spin chain because order matters, right? So X is like the position, it's like I'm at perimeter. And now at perimeter, I have a big spin chain in my office. And uh, that spin chain has locality in the spin chain. So, so this, this dimension that appears, this one dimension has nothing to do with the original four dimensions, right? The fact that X is four dimensional, who cares? X could be six dimensional, eight dimension, 10 dimension, doesn't matter, right? The dimension of space time here is not playing any role. Why? Because everything is at a single X. So forget about it. X is whatever. Right. Want. Right. So the locality is not in your. It's not locality space. in four dimensions. It's locality in this one dimensional <laughs> inching. Right. Okay. And that's what I wanted to clarify. Okay. Which is what we care. When I have a one dimensional spin chain, I care about locality yes. in the one dimension. Um, so uh, just to, uh, I mean, you know, uh, is there any way to connect uh, the locality along the spin chain to locality uh, in the in the manifold? Uh, like, can you view a, a spin chain at a point X as like the point X as a coarse grained uh, you know, you're you're zooming out, um, and and if you zoom in, the x would actually split up into, you know, something like. Uh, um, the connection between locality in uh, space time and locality um, in the spin chain is not direct at all, and in fact, if it were to indicate something, it would be the opposite that uh, there will be some notion of non-locality in uh, in four dimensions okay so mm. so let, let me okay so let me postpone that question so the short answer is uh, it's not easy because one dimension is one dimension four dimensions four dimension so let me postpone that if you want i can answer but uh, um i want to go back to telling you why these operators are simple and for that I want to, to emphasize. So we have this local non nearest neighbor Hamiltonian, and this Hamiltonian gamma f was equal 
So uh, remember, okay, at one loop, it came multiplied by lambda, the coupling. This was the coupling. And so if you do the explicit computation, the result you will get is something like this. Let me write it. It's something like you do the explicit Feynman diagram and you get lambda, you get some pi stuff, eight pi squared. This is from some integration over four dimensions of these quartic vertices. And then there is a summation up to L of some nearest neighbor Hamiltonian that, as I said, is something like identity. And then there are the coefficients A and B, and they are the following, if I remember correctly, minus P plus two times K. So you see that A is minus one, B is two. Okay. And this acts at position I and I plus one. So that's the locality that we are mentioning. Okay. Now, uh, yes, this is correct. Um, I'm pretty sure it's correct. And now we see the following. So we see that the coefficient of the identity is uh, the same. So, so there are two, there is a key, now a very important observation. And this observation is the following. So what is special about the Hamiltonian? So first of all, it has a, a, a part proportional to the identity that we don't care, right? It's just a shift of the energy, right? So the coefficient of the identity, we don't care. So, but what is physical is the, the ratio between the coefficient of K and the coefficient of P. That's what different models will correspond to, right? Different SO6 Hamiltonians will have different ratios of k over p. So here, the ratio of the k coefficient and the p coefficient apparently seems to be equal to minus 2, right? It's 2 divided by minus 1. Now, like I told you, the space of integrable theories, right? you could go all the way to the very beginning, the space of integrable theories are particular space in the space of one dimensional models. And inside this one dimensional spin chain, sometimes there are some that are special. And if you go to, um, to the Russian books and you ask which SO6 spin chain is integrable, it's when the ratio is minus two. Okay, so this ratio is such, is the precise ratio that gives, that tells that this spin chain is integrable. So this Sorry. spin chain is exactly solvable, actually. Sorry, can you repeat how you obtained the numbers minus one and plus two? So here I just did Feynman diagrams, right? Remember that uh, I just computed this diagram. This gives a divergence. It's proportional to logarithm of the cutoff. That divergence depends on the index i, i plus one and j, j plus one, because the vertex does depend on those indices, right? So different choices gives different divergences and the different weights are by definition the Hamiltonian. Remember the Hamiltonian was the coefficient of the logarithmic divergence. So I just do a computation when the indices are, for example, one, two, one, two, that's the coefficient of the identity. Then I do one, two, two, one, that's the coefficient of the permutation. And then I do one, one, three, three, and that's the coefficient of the trace. Okay, yeah. So I do the three Feynman diagrams with these three choices, and I read off directly the three coefficient identity permutation and trace. So can I ask it? Uh, so the P and K corresponds, uh, correspond to two permutations that you had in the previous slide. So say P corresponds to the, the permutation you wrote and the, what permutation is K then? In pictures, identity is doing nothing. P yeah. is permuting the uh, spins and K is identifying spin I and I plus one and J and J plus one. I see. So if you want me, I will write more explicitly. So if I have a spin chain, I have A and B, right? And this A and B, these are two nearest neighbors. So each of them is one up to six. Yeah. And so 
permutation acting on A and B just gives B and A. And K acting on A and B gives zero unless A is equal to B. And when A is equal to B, then it produces C and C. Okay. And is it the whole, the all, the set of all such possible permutations or there yes. can be? Yes. With SO6 symmetry, you only have permutation, K and identity. And one, a, a trivial way of seeing that that's the case, it's because um, you only have uh, three reducible representations in the product of uh, two vectors of SO6. Yeah, I see. So do the eigenvalues of this resulting Hamiltonian satisfy if, uh, or uh, do, they, do they decrease since they represent a higher orders or, or is that? Uh, uh, sorry, can you repeat again? What commutes, sorry? Uh, no, no, or the eigenvalues of this uh, Hamiltonian, mm -hmm. um, do they decrease or do they have some properties uh, that one can already specify? Uh, so, what is, so Dagen, so now there is a story that we can compute, we can exactly solve this theory. And by this, we mean we can write down explicitly the eigenvalues as solutions of what are called bit and Zatz equations. So there are some bit and Zatz solution that we can solve. And uh, in this way, compute the full spectrum of this Hamiltonian. Let me emphasize something very different here from people that do Gunas matter and critical spin chains which is here, we care about all spin chains. Spin chains of length two, of length three, of length four, of length 10, of length 100. It's not like we only care about large spin chains. In fact, you could say that the small ones are even more interesting. I mean, the smallest operators you have would be the ones with the lowest dimensions. So we care about all spin chains. So when the spin chain has length uh, two or four, your matrix is a finite matrix and you can just plot all the eigenvalues. But when the matrix is big, the problem is exponentially complex, right? As we know very well, then we have bit and zats. So this is an what important is the, comment. What is uh, the name of those diagrams again? I didn't catch that. The, the name of what, sorry? Uh, the diagram that you just mentioned. The, it was or not that, like bit and zats. So it's possible to oh, solve. Be, 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 oh, bet and zats, right, right, right. Okay, 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 sorry. Um, so this is integrable. So by integrable, we mean it's solvable by bit and zats. Now, the solution by bit and zats, incidentally, it's like a tensor network solution. And I, if you want, I can describe a little bit how this solution by bit and zats, you can think of it as a tensor network solution. So, so in that sense, uh, that's a, uh, that's where the tensor network would appear. So uh, in this entire discussion, uh, I mean, um, it, it, it seems to apply to any non-abelian theory. I mean, uh, yes. what are the aspects which crew where it, where like it, the crucial dependence on uh, the n is so, equal to four? Uh, right, exactly, great point. So. Well, I take this, it's local, just because of large n in any gauge theory, that's true. Eigenstates are good operators, any gauge theory, awesome. Eigenvalues are the dimensions, it's true in any gauge theory. I get something which is of this form. Well, that's because I have six scalars in n equals four. If I had a theory with seven scalars, it would be similar, but with SO7 symmetry. And these coefficients would be other numbers that I compute by Feynman Dyer. So of all this, everything is totally generic, as you say, except mm -hmm. the fact that the ratio turns out to be minus two. That's the only special thing so far. And this is what we could not have guessed. Everything else, that it's an Hamiltonian, that it's local, that it's a combination of permutation and mm -hmm. trace, all of that was built in, it has to be. I mean, we did not right. think. Now, the fact that this ratio is minus two, that's the miracle. <laughs> and uh, that's what says that within all the one dimensional structures I could get, I get the nice ones. Right? I get the integrable ones, the ones that I can have any hope of solving. So that was not built in, that was luck. Uh, but uh, this, this uh, I mean, um, there, there, there are many, many different kinds of integrable uh, 
uh, spin chains, right? That's right. And uh, I mean, I mean, it, with it, SO6 symmetry and nearest neighbors, this is the only one. With SO6 and right now, the thing is that see, um, ultimately, we we are asking all these questions because I mean, I suppose <laughs> we are interested in the problem of quantum gravity, right? Uh, I mean, uh, that's one uh, motivation. We want to solve. Uh, n equals four supernovas. N equals four supernovas is dual to quantum gravity. So if we solve right. all these spin chains and so on, we are solving quantum right. gravity. Exactly. So so that now the thing is that n is equal to four is dual to five-dimensional antidecitor, right? ADS yes. five cross S five. Right. So uh, so there are two things. The first thing is that well, what is the space-time interpretation of these spin chains? Uh, the bulk, the bulk geometrical interpretation of spin chains, and okay. then the second uh, question. Uh, <laughs> I'll ask the second question later. Okay. Okay. So, so there is a here a very important question, which is um, uh, Deepak is asking, which is, what is so we have uh, we we have in n equals four super young mills. We encountered some nice one dimensional objects where this 1D has nothing to do with a 4D and we got some one dimensional um, spin chain. So we got this one dimensional structure that has a bunch of spin, right? And then there was the question, this theory is dual to string theory. There is this holography and there is string theory in ADS5 times S5. And you can ask, what is the dual of this spin chain? Right? What, is, what corresponds to this one dimensional structure in string theory? Right? Uh, now, actually, I mean, what do we know about string theory? String theory is made of strings, and strings are one dimensional objects. So the answer is, it's the string. So the spin chain is the string. This one dimensional object is the one dimensional string. Right, exactly. And so uh, the locality of the spin chain becomes the locality of the points on the string. Right. So the, lo the fact that, these are, that there is some locality on the spin chain, it's locality of the phonons of the string, right? If I have some excitations on the string, they interact if they are local. If they are uh -huh. far away, they don't talk to each other until the phonon arrives there. Right, right, right. right so right. locality on the world chain. Now, on mm -hmm. the other hand, if I have a string, yes, things are local on the world sheet, but strings can start becoming fluffy objects and big and so on. And mm -hmm. so if you have locality in the string, it's not guaranteed that they have locality in space time. That right. depends right. if the tension of the string is big, things are short, mm -hmm. small and interact locally. If the strings mm -hmm. have a very low string tension, they open up and they are big, fluffy, big objects and the things are not mm -hmm. local in space time. Mm -hmm. And that's why this intuition, the locality in one dimension, don't immediately imply locality in four dimension. Right, 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 right. right. So that, that was uh, why I was postponing answering that question about 1D versus 4D locality. Right. Now we can. Uh, can I ask my second question or should I wait? Uh... Um, let me make one comment here before uh, you ask the second question. Okay. The comment I want to make is that now this Hamiltonian, as um, Johannes was asking, it has many eigenstates and so on, but you could ask, are there simple eigenstates of this Hamiltonian, right? What are the trivial eigenstates? What is the vacuum of this Hamiltonian, you could ask, right? And the vacuum are basically the spin chains, the states Psi, that are very easy to describe they are just symmetric and traceless. So let's see why. Because you see that this combination here, identity minus permutation, if, you, if your operator, if your tensor is symmetric, kills it, right? So if your psi is symmetric, is symmetric, identity minus permutation kills it. And because it's traceless, it's killed by, by k, by definition. So if you remember, if you take any psi i1 up to i l that has these two properties, one it's traceless, it's symmetric. So if I have i1 and if I swap i k plus one and i k, 
I get the same thing and it's traceless. That means that if I contract two indices, any two indices, I get zero, right? So any symmetric traceless tensor. So any combination that is symmetric and traceless has zero energy. And so these guys have zero energy. So that means that the classical dimension is the quantum dimension, right? So these guys have dimension equal to the classical dimension, the size of the spin chain plus zero. There's no quantum correction. In spin chain language, we would say these are the ferromagnetic vacuum. This would correspond to the ferromagnetic vacuum. So let's write an example of such symmetric traces. An example is the operator I started with Z, Z many times Z. Okay. Let's see why this is this works. So let me do this computation and then you can ask your question. So I want to act Hamiltonian acting on the state, spin chain state, that is a product of many Z, 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 Z. Okay. Now, remember that what we wrote is the Hamiltonian acting on scalars I1 up to IL. But this Z is just a linear combination. It's just phi1 plus I phi2. Right? So if I open this up, this guy contains two to the L terms, right? Some where I just take phi one from each operator, some phi ones and some phi two. So it's a big, big combination. But we can study what happens with the identity acting on ZZ, the permutation acting on ZZ, and the trace acting on ZZ. And I draw two because it's local, so I only care about two. So the identity gives back ZZ. The permutation, you can open up and then permute the scalars and then reassemble them, gives back ZZ. And more interestingly, this gives zero, indicating that the trace is zero. So let's just see how this works. Why does this give zero? Because this guy is phi one, phi one. Let's write all four terms, plus I, phi one, phi two, plus I, phi two, phi one, plus phi two, phi two. But more important, I have to fix the mistake I just did. I times I gives minus. And remember, what does the trace give? The trace gives zero here, gives zero here because they are not the same. And here, the indices are the same. It gives all possible states. And here it gives the same, but they come with a different minus sign. So indeed the result is zero. Okay. In more physical terms, what I did was I took real scalars and I gave them charge by considering this combination phi one plus i phi two. So phi one plus i phi two, I gave them charge. Now they are charged under the rotation that rotates phi one and phi two. They have a U1 charge there. And if they have U1 charge, I cannot annihilate them. I cannot draw this picture when I annihilate Z and Z because each has one unit of charge. So, if, so now if I go to this combination where things are charged, I have Z, I have Z bar, which is phi one minus I phi two and Z with Z bar can annihilate and produce Z and Z bar, but Z with Z cannot. And so it has to be zero. And therefore this Hamiltonian gives zero because each pair gives zero by itself. Okay. And so this is like at each side I have spin up. But instead of up, it's Z. It's a complex, it's, an, it's just a null scalar. Right? And so this is like a ferromagnetic vacuum. Now I choose Z. I could choose phi three plus I phi four. I could choose phi six plus I phi four. I can choose any combination. That's the usual thing. That's spontaneous symmetry breaking. It's like in an SU2 spin chain. You can also choose spin up to be your ferromagnetic vacuum or spin down or spin left or spin right. And all of them have the same energy. And which vacuum you go to, you choose. And there is a degeneracy and there are many operators that are simple, right? And so we see that now we have our SO6 vacuum 
which are just some direction. Here we chose Z, for example. But there are more, of course, there are many choices. And so these operators parameterized by this choice are the simplest possible operators, right? They have no anomalous dimension. So they have just dimension equal to L, right? Quantum dimension is equal to zero. The ferromagnetic state has zero energy. Now in condensed matter, if you tell this to someone, they say, I don't care. What matters is difference of energies, but here we do care. The zeros matters. And so these guys are our simple operators. They are the symmetric traceless operators. Z is an example. Other operators would be other examples. And so uh, the sim out of infinitely many operators we have, in this gauge theory. Here inside lies a special class, the simplest ones, which are the spin chain ferromagnetic vacuum, spin chain vacuum, vacua, which are these operators of the type that it's like all spins are up, z, z, tuck, 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 z. In other words, trace of z to the k, okay? So when I started my presentation, I said the octagon is, the, let's still remember when I start, it's a four point function. And then I said, the first operator of the four point function is this one. And then we went on this detour, which is great. Of course, I mean, the purpose is to discuss and to see whatever people ask, I will go in that direction. But this was all, you see, related to, I don't know, 16 slides ago, when we started saying the octagon is a four point function and of what operators and I started saying the simplest ones now you understand well why are these guys here and so now we see why they are the ferromagnetic vacuum of this spin chain and one of the operators of the four point function is this one here that I wrote here okay so now my goal is to uh, what I would propose is to continue telling you what are the other three operators and what is this octagon uh, result? And then uh, we can go back. But now it's a good, I think it's a good time for you to ask your question. So now that we know where we are. Okay, thanks. Uh, thank you for your patience, uh, by the way. No, no, it's, it's great. I mean, I have nothing. <laughs> I have no goal. Um, I, don't, I don't need to reach any place. <laughs> well, no, I mean, but you might get hungry or your family might. Uh, uh, okay, so I'll ask. Uh, my, so the question is, uh, one thing is why why should the vacuum? It's not clear to me. It's not obvious. Why should the vacuum state be symmetric and traceless? So I just said that if it's symmetric and traceless, the energy is zero. You are asking why is that the vacuum? Uh, yeah, I mean, I mean, I. So you understood that it has energy if, zero, right? If it's uh, symmetric and traceless. If you take a if state. It's symmetric and traceless. If you take a state that it's uh -huh. symmetric then uh, it is killed by identity minus permutation, right? Because mm -hmm. if it's symmetric, mm -hmm. symmetric sure. means that if you look at two sides, it's the same if you swap the two sides. Sure, sure. But then identity minus permutation projects into anti-symmetric, right? So if something is symmetric, okay, okay. that identity and permutator give the same thing. So those two terms- And if it's traceless, then K is zero, right? Okay. And, say, and then if it's traceless, that's the definition ah. of K being zero. I see, I see, okay, great. Oh, now, what you could you. ask uh, is, okay, you could just say, okay, that just shows that they have zero and it doesn't show that this is the vacuum. That's right, that's right. That. But, that, but it's true, but then, okay, that you can believe me. <laughs> now, normally, and that's because of the sign, because the sign is plus. If the sign was minus, then it would be not the vacuum. Then the vacuum would be more like antiferromagnetic. Right. So in condensed matter, you tell people, let me study an SU2 spin chain. They don't even ask you what the, what the sign is. They assume the sign is antiferromagnetic because who cares about the ferromagnetic vacuum, right? All spins are up. It's totally boring, right? If you tell people, let's study the ferromagnetic vacuum, they, they slam the door on you, right? right, uh, right. Here, we are lucky that the vacuum is the ferromagnetic. It's simple. 
So the empty ferromagnetic would be the operators with the largest dimension. So they are the most quantum ones. The, more, the, the easiest ones are the ones which, have, which are ferromagnetic. So if I, the, the, spectrum, uh, if I compute the spectrum, it's a bunch of lines. And in one uh, end of the lines is ferromagnetic, in the other is anti-ferromagnetic. If you flip the sign of the Hamiltonian, you swap who is who, right? right Here, yeah, yeah. the lowest one turns out to be ferromagnetic and the highest one mm -hmm. anti-ferromagnetic. Yeah, but the, the, the reason that anti-ferromagnetic is particularly interesting is uh, in condensed matter. And also I, I think in, 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 high, in high energy is because uh, of its relationship with the uh, phase diagram of high temperature superconductors, right? And so you have different phases. You have a superconducting phase, an antiferromagnetic phase, and yeah. uh, the pseudo gap phase. And and the thing is that all of these different phases can be understood as 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 uh, different aspects of this antiferromagnetic vacuum. Let me maybe say it in. Uh, let me. Uh, have a comment that is related to what you said, which is that even simpler than that, the ferromagnetic vacuum has no entanglement, it has no interesting long range structure. The ferromagnetic vacuum right. is up, 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 up. Whereas the anti ferromagnetic, it's a big combination of many, many states. That's why we use quantum networks and all that, right? So, and it has lots of interest, it's a very complicated state, right? Another difference that the ferromagnetic vacuum spontaneously breaks the symmetry. You choose one direct. The anti-ferromagnetic vacuum preserves the symmetry. It's a singular to degree. So they are very different physics. The anti-ferromagnetic is much more intricate. And it's because uh -huh. the, even the vacuum itself has all this long-range entanglement structure and it's very complicated structure, that its excitations on top of the anti-ferromagnetic can be quasi-particles and you can have all this funny behavior that uh, you can have precisely because even the vacuum where you are expanding around is already complicated to start with. Right, right, right. So, so I mean, from that perspective, you know, I mean, the anti-ferromagnetic vacuum, it, you know, I mean, is there any scope of saying that in, 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 in... So here, uh, Right now, in the, in the, uh, at this point, we have each operator is a spin chain state, and each operator is just a combination of the scalars of the non-abelian gauge theory, and the anti-ferromagnetic is just one of the combinations, and the ferromagnetic right. is another one. So at this point, there's nothing particularly deep. For example, if your spin chain has size two, right, there is one combination that is uh, like a singlet and one that is the, anti the, the triplet, we are doing SU2, say, right? And you will not say one is more special than the other. Okay, that you have the triplet and you have the singlet, and this will be two operators of n equals four supreme mu. Mm -hmm. okay. Thanks for the discussion. Thanks. Okay. So here there, there is no uh, entanglement; it's a product state. But That's right. Uh, here it would be the, the vacuum would be a product state, like z z z z z. No entanglement. Right. Uh, and for other states that do have a, a entanglement. So, to what does that entanglement correspond in the in, in four dimensions? So, not in the spin chain, but um, of the yeah of the like underlying theory. I don't know. That's a good question. I don't know. Um, <laughs> another right, and and entanglement is also the reason why antiferromagnetic would be more interesting, you know, because uh, from the perspective of uh, building up time, you from an entanglement, you know, that, that, uh, that perspective. So. Yes, but again, we should be careful with spin chain versus space time. Sure, sure, sure. sure. So here, there are two things we want to understand, right? So you could ask two questions and they're very different. One is, I started a spin chain. A spin chain is a one dimensional object, but it's a spin chain, it's not a spin. No, but uh, but right. uh, so one question uh, ask, we have. So one question you can ask them just a minute is, if I start with a spin chain, how does it become a string? Mm -hmm. That's one type of question. So I start with a discrete spin chain, and suddenly I'm saying it it's it's it has an alternative description in terms of a smooth string. So there mm -hmm. is some emergence there. 
how does the smoothness of the string emerge? How do I start with some discrete spin chain and I get a smooth string? There is another emergence, which is I start with spin chain, one at each point in space time, which is a four dimensional object. And they are strings that move in ADS5. So now I need an extra dimension to emerge. That's another type of emergence. That's mm -hmm. the emergence of target space. So you mm -hmm. have world ship emergence. How does the string appear? And you have target space emergence. How do I see that even if I start with this four dimensional gauge theory, suddenly I have ADS5 and S5 showing up. It's much bigger space times. So how do I see that it's a string? And how do I think that it's moving in a bigger space time? So there are, are two different questions. Uh, right, right, and uh, I mean, yeah, of course. Uh, so, if you, if if you, if you if you imagine that you know one can address the first question, uh, which is the emergence of the string from the spin chain. Let's say that you know that that question, you know, let's say that we have an answer to that. Yeah, we do. Uh, then the second, <laughs> then the second question we would uh, would be that uh, you know uh, how do how do how does space time emerge from from the strings? Right from a collection of strings. That's and, right. Uh, that that's where the entanglement aspect and the antiferromagnetic aspect of spin chain would uh, maybe come in. Okay. So yeah, that, I don't know how to make that size, uh, but I agree that morally it's reasonable. That's right. That's the hard. Devil is in the details, right? Sorry. The devil. The devil. There's ah, a thing, right? The de devil is in the details. So. Yeah. Okay, so okay, so here what we are seeing is that we have lambda. This lambda is the coupling. Right? And what we studied was order lambda, and this means one loop. And this is the leading quantum effect. Now, solving the theory means going from order lambda to a function of lambda. And a function of lambda would be all loops. In other words, this would be an exact solution. Now, at one loop, we were dealing with a nearest neighbor, local Hamiltonian. What happens when I go beyond that? When I start doing two loops, three loops, four loops? Well, it's easy to think what's going to happen. If you go back to the picture, how the local Hamiltonian appears, you can easily see that if I'm doing two loops, I have an extra vertex, for example, here. Now I can have a next to nearest neighbor interaction, right? These spins can interact now three spins. And so, the more powers I increase in lambda, I start having more and more neighbors. Right? And so going at lambda square, we have a next to nearest neighbor Hamiltonian, etc. The range starts to increase as I go to more and more orders in perturbation. Question? Eventually, when I, if I consider any power of lambda, I lose this notion of locality. It starts local, a bit longer, a bit longer, a bit longer. Eventually, everyone is talking to everyone, right? It's a bit like in the real life. If I have two spins, they couple to living order, just neighbors. But then there is a little bit longer range, right? If I have a material, the I and I plus two still talk a little bit to each other. I and I plus three talk a little bit less and so on. These couplings are going to be smaller and smaller. But it's not like in a one dimensional magnet, it's just neighbors. It's neighbors plus a little bit of next neighbors, plus a little bit, plus a little bit, and decaying with distance. But a priori, it is a collection of all possible interactions. And so solving this theory at any lambda would mean taming this complicated now non local spin chain or string. Okay? And, uh, and so this is, I mean, so of course, you can imagine that this is hard. Even the one loop, even solving the nearest neighbor of spin chains is hard. If they are integrable, it's a bit easier. But now it's not even local, it's local, next to local, and so on. So it's a complicated object. Right? 
And so the octagon that I spoke about is an example where we will have an object, which is the octagon, that we can indeed compute at any lambda. And we can plot it if you want, right? As a function of lambda, the coupling of the theory, and we can have some nice plot. So that's why it's a very exciting object. So it's not like I can do it for everything, but some for there is a physical quantity in n equals four that we can do this beautiful thing. I just take this quantity and I really plot it if I want. Yeah. So an example where we can do this is the octagon. So that's why it's a nice place to look at. So say, if I were to suffer and do all this, what is the end point? How does it look like? How is this function of coupling looking like? And uh, that's what I would uh, like to tell. Uh, or I could stop here. I could say, yeah, this is possible to do. And one of them is the octagon. And I already gave you an exposition of bit of integrability and how it appears in ADS-CFT. I would let uh, Johannes decide, I mean, uh, up to you. I can either continue or I could just tell you and you would believe and I will tell you, go check the papers by Frank where this octagon is one example where this program can be carried out and you can look and stare at the finite coupling uh, result. So before I ask Johannes what I should do, let me maybe take the question by Meng. Hey, so my question was, uh, no, is it just spins interact through longer range or you start to get like multi-body interactions as well like three body uh so you start getting three three body as well but local okay uh, you, you, yeah so if you were in, if you were thinking of the best you two language it would be like si wedge si plus one dot si plus two stuff like yeah. that yeah. okay and then you you, you lose integrability from like lambda square, is that right or? No, the beauty is that it's always integrable in if you interpret in a precise sense that the Hamilton and the generator are integral. Okay, cool, thank you. But they are integrable in a subtle sense. They are integrable in, in this sense. If I write the Hamiltonian, right now, when we write a one loop Hamiltonian, lambda is small because it's a perturbation theory parameter, but I don't care. I can say lambda is 3.5 because it's just an overall constant that multiplies the Hamiltonian, right? It just rescales the end. So who cares about what lambda is, right? When I, do two, two, when I go to two loops, I have lambda, the first term, and lambda squared, the second term, right? And now there is a big difference. You can either say lambda is a, param a parameter, and now you really have a, a finite ratio between the second neighbors and the first neighbors, or you can say I'm doing perturbation theory. So I'm treating the second neighbor as perturbation with respect to first neighbor. Now it's a really conceptually different thing. Mm. And it's in the perturbative sense that you preserve integrability. But in the truncated sense, the model is not integral. Mm. Right, so here when I say non-local, this next nearest neighbor, I mean that generically, it's a coupling of three spins with three spins. It includes also the two spin with the length range two, but it also includes three body interaction. So, yeah, maybe people give some uh, indications if they are interested in the octagon further explanations or. Mm, yes, I still don't know what is the octagon. Uh, yeah, definitely. Yeah, please pay to uh, okay. uh, the So, so, uh, so let's see. So, what is this octagon? So, the idea is uh, so, first, if I start with the simplest, uh, if I start with uh, the simplest operators, trace of z to the k at some position x, we already know quite a lot about these operators. You know their dimension delta is equal to L plus zero. So there are no quantum effects. Because of this, their two-point function is quite simple. If I have trace 
of z to the k at some position x and the conjugate trace of z bar to the k at position y, the result is just one divided by x minus y to the power 2k. And that's it. Okay, this length is equal to k, of course. And so we finished computing the two-point function. There's nothing. It is just one divided by a power law and the power the exponent we know it's just as if the field was free, even though it's not. Now, what does it mean? It means that the propagation of this interaction between point X and Y is trivial. There's nothing special propagating between point X and Y. It's very simple to compute. Okay. Uh, by the way, let me anticipate that in ADS CFT, when we have the boundary of ADS, which is the, the space where um, n equals four is, and here we have ADS five, I, this object, what would this be dual to? It would correspond to inserting a string at some position X and receiving it at some position Y. And this string, looks just like a geodesic that travels between the two points, but it's a point-like string. It doesn't open up into some fluffy object. It's a string that is like collapsed to a point. It's just a point going from one point to the other. So there is this structure, which is point-like. And it's the fact that it's such a simple point-like structure going from one point to the other that is the string theory version of these operators being particularly simple. The fact that these operators are very simple and the two-point function is very simple should correspond in ADS-CFT to a propagation between Y and uh, X to be very simple. And here it is. It is just a point-like geodesic going from one point to the other. Okay, and I remind you that in a CFT, this is the only dependence you can get. It's x minus y to some number. It just turns out that this number is an integer and it's known and we know what it is. Now, the next object you could consider, if this one is simple, the next one you can consider is, you can consider the interaction between three strings. And you can just let them interact. You throw them into the bulk and they interact with each other. Okay. So what would be this object more precisely? Well, let's write something. For example, this could be a trace of Z to the length one, a trace of Z to the length L2, and a trace of Z bar to the length L3, where L3 will be L1 plus L2. This would be non-zero. And we could ask, what about this three-point function? Okay. Now this three-point function, so this was the two-point function. Now I'm asking, okay, if the two-point function is too simple, what about the three-point function? And here we see that this two-point function is equal to this. And this is the two point function at lambda equal to zero. So I just compute without any interaction and that's the exact result. And it turns out that this object at lambda is equal also to the same thing with lambda equal to zero also. In other words, the interaction between three of these strings is also very simple. You just can compute it without any coupling. The result you get is it has some combinatorics of the ways of doing the weak contraction between these operators, but you can just do these combinatorics and you get some result and that's it. And whatever result you get, that result is the result at finite coupling. It's the same as the result at lambda equal to zero. One way of proving that result is by using supersymmetry. It's a consequence of supersymmetry as it was a consequence of supersymmetry that the two point function was protected, that it was independent of one. And so this three-point function is trivial. The two-point function is also trivial. So you ask, what about the four-point function? 
Now, the four point function is also the most interesting correlation function in a CFT because while the two and three point functions are fixed by symmetry, they have to have a particular space time dependence, they have to be simple power loss. The four point function, no. The four point function, you can now have functions of combinations of distances that are invariant under conformal transformations, and therefore you can have non trivial space time dependence. So let me remind you about that, that in a CFT, two points and three points are fixed in the sense that the space-time dependence are fixed, dictates the form of these correlators. Right? They are just power laws. Now, four-point function However, can be an entry a four point function can depend on what are called conformal cross ratios. For example, I'm going to write one. If I have four points, I can say the distance between one and two, the distance between three and four. I can construct the following combination divided by the distance between one and three and the distance between two and four. So this combination, we can define and call it U, it's a cross ratio. It's invariant under dilatations, it's invariant under special conformal transformations. If you do conformal transformation, this object is invariant. And so your correlation function, if you have a four point function now, and if say you divided by the four point function at lambda equal to zero, just for normalization purposes, then this guy here would be a function of the coupling, of course, lambda, but also of these cross ratios u. Maybe there are a few of them, let's put ui if there are more than one cross ratio. Okay, and the answer is there are two. So there is a u and a v. Okay, and so this function here is a very interesting function, right? It depends on the coupling. So it interpolates between the spin chain world when lambda is very small and the string world when the string tension is very big that turns out to correspond to lambda very big. It depends on the geometry of the points. So I can take various limits of the distance between the points. And so this would be an example of an object that we would love to compute exactly in holography, this correlation function. So the octagon O is one such correlation function. Okay. So let me tell you which one it is. So it's actually the simplest one you could consider. So let's try to build what would be the simplest correlation function you could consider. The simplest interesting one. So let, let's consider. So here I have a spin chain. That's the first operator. And it has a bunch of spins. And here there will be another spin chain with a bunch of spins. And here there will be another spin chain with a bunch of spins. And here another spin chain with a bunch of spins. OK. So what is what are these? So this guy would be this ferromagnetic vacuum we said. This one is going to be just z to the k. What about the bottom one? The bottom one, z, I remind you, is something like phi1 plus i phi2. So for example, z bar would be phi1 minus i phi2. So it'll be the conjugate scale. What about in the bottom here? Let's use, let's say that this guy is X to the K where X is another combination of scalars. For example, phi three plus I phi four. Now Z and X cannot connect to each other. So we can't connect Z and X. So what can we do? We can connect, for example, Z with this guy. Let's suppose we do this, right? 
So that means that this spin chain is something like a trace of Z and how many of them? Well, let's suppose half of the ones go here. And, it, and if this is Z, this should be Z bar, right? A Z propagates to a Z bar, right? Z with Z have zero two point function because they have charge. So Z and Z bar have two point function one. Is it clear? You see that Z with Z is phi one plus I phi two with phi one plus I phi two. If you open up the parentheses, you get phi one phi one minus phi two phi two. They give the same, so they give zero. Okay. So it should contain this. And this, I remind you, what is this state? This is just Z bar, Z bar, Z bar, Z bar, K over two times. And then next, I want to say after this, these guys connect here. Okay, that's the simplest thing I could do. Right? So that means that this operator should also contain x bar to the power k over two. In other words, it should contain x bar, x bar, x bar, x bar, k over two times. And that's it. Let's suppose this is the operator. Let's close the parenthesis. This is a spin chain state. It's a spin chain state where the first few sites are in the ferromagnetic vacuum, one ferromagnetic vacuum. Then there is a domain wall, and then there are the, the other ones are in another ferromagnetic vacuum. Now, there is an obvious problem. This state is not an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian, right? I, I don't have a, I mean, if I have a state like a, 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 a Hamiltonian, an eigenstate of the Hamiltonian is not all spins up here and then suddenly all spins down, right? This would cost energy to have this transition. Another way of saying is that this object is not symmetric traceless. Why not? Well, because it's not symmetric, right? I mean, if I swap uh, these guys here, I don't get the same thing. Right? It's traceless because whenever I actually trace in each two operators, Z bar with Z bar or X with X, we saw it's zero. And Z bar with X bar, of course it's zero because they don't even share any numbers, any scalar. So it's traceless, but it's not symmetric. Do you agree? But that's easy to remedy. We just say the operator is this plus permutations where I just symmetrize by hand. Right? So the state will be this plus all possible reshufflings of yellow and, and, and pink. But the reshufflings, because of locality, because I need to contract and draw things in the plane, the reshufflings are not, don't contribute. Okay. And so I can immediately write this, and this would be the, 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 the only diagram that would contribute. And what do we choose for this other operator here? So this is operator. This is what I insert at position X1. This is what I put at position X2. This is what I put at position X3. What do I put at position X4? I can put the same. I can put uh, here. I can insert the same type of operator. Same as what I have uh, there. And all these four corners are now ferromagnetic vacuums, but different ferromagnetic vacuums. You can think that one is pure Z, one is pure X, and the other one is what I get by acting with some lowering operator that rotates into a mixture of Z and X. Right? It's like one state would be up to the L, one would be down to the L, and one would be a combination of up with a few down acting by acting with a bunch of lowering operators that just globally rotates the state. And now, because it's the same as there, what would I have to do? I would have to just contract these guys like this. And then contract the guys like this. Right? And if the coupling is zero, that's the only thing I can do. 
If the coupling is zero by locality, that's the only thing we can draw. And why do we like this choice of operator? So now it's the only choice we can draw. And what object do I have here? I have one line, one line, one line, one line. And then there is a bit of a spin chain. So I put another line here. I put a little bit like this, a little bit, a little bit, a little bit. And if you count how many segments I have, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. So this is an octagon. Okay. So this object is the octagon. And this object, octagon, so there is a single diagram. So this octagon O starts with one because there is a single diagram when lambda is zero. Then there is plus lambda times something, plus lambda squared times something, plus dot, dot, dot. So that all in all, I get some function that depends on these four points through the cross ratios ui and also depends on the tooth coupling lambda. Okay. And this is the octagon uh, object. So in this case, it's the simplest possible object we can draw. It's not the most obvious one from a condensed matter point of view. If I start studying spin chains here, what I'm saying is that instead of going into the spin chain and considering the excited states, take four spin chains, rotate them differently, like different ferromagnetic vacuum and connect them. Like some experiment that connects the four spin chains. Right? So if each of them would be some kind of tensor network, it's like connect this tensor network in a way that connects them all and extracts a number out of it. Right? But from an holography point of view, that's what we would like to study these four string interactions. And the point is that we know this octagon at finite coupling. And I think I will stop here and just say that this object O is now known. It was derived and it was derived last year or it was it last year, maybe two years ago by Frank Coronado. And you see that one way of getting it, we could start with spin chains. And there is a technique to go all the way and work our way, increasing the complexity along the lines of what I started describing and eventually would go to the octagon. But now, and now that you have the octagon, there's obviously the question, what about quantum gravity? And what about any possible string interaction, et cetera? And where do we go from here? We have the simplest possible object. We can compute it at any coupling. So it's one result we already have. How do we expand and how do we ask all the interesting questions we could, we could imagine asking about holography and so on. And, uh, but I think for the purpose of this lecture of telling you more or less where we stand, oops, this is not a question. It's really an octagon. Uh, this octagon um, is known. I don't think I have time or people have enough energy. I think it's, it would be too much information to write it down. I can tell you there's a beautiful representation for it. It's a determinant of an explicit matrix M and this determinant, uh, this matrix M depends on the coupling and on the cross ratios. And it's an infinite times infinite dimensional matrix. So it's a determinant of an infinite dimensional matrix. And, uh, and it's, um, you can uh, go and, uh, and check it out. And there was, and now we understand that there was one path towards deriving this result through starting with the spin chains, understanding well, this uh, tensor networks and all the structure of the spin chains, contracting them and so on. But one of the things that Frank also understood is that there is another connection, another way of getting to this result through using so-called bootstrap ideas. And you probably heard talks about bootstrap and conformal bootstrap and so on. And there seems to also be a way of arriving at this result with some hindsight. Once you knew already the result, you could say, oh, this result obeys some very nice property, this correlation function. And just using those properties, I could have fixed completely this object. And it's very much unclear how much we could do, 
sidetracking, bypassing all this integrability business and jumping directly to interesting questions about quantum gravity and other correlation functions from a more bootstrappy point of view. And uh, so there's a lot of interesting stuff going on in the relation between bootstrap and this pin chain approach about integrability and the relation to bootstrap. There are many, lots of interesting works trying to generalize this uh, first correlation function that we have, this four point function to a more general four point functions that in particular, this will describe more quantum gravity quantities, quantum gravity related quantities. And, uh, but I would say that uh, this is probably uh, a good point uh, to stop. So that's it. Yeah, thank you so much for the nice talk. Uh, I guess we can unmute and uh, clap for your talk. Yeah, the so black box is very nice. Uh, and uh, of course, we still can ask questions. So, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, so, so I have a question. So, what exactly makes you sure now that with finding one out of infinitely many four point functions, that there's even like a slight chance of finding all the others? So, the proposal is that uh, there is a fundamental object, a fundamental building block that you can use to build everything. So here I spoke about the octagon, but uh, the point is that this octagon, you can say this octagon looks too complicated. It's too hard to study. And so you can go and cut the octagon into two. Now, if you cut it into two, what object do you get? Let's draw it. And you get an hexagon. Right? Okay. The claim is that the hexagon is a universal object. And if you know the hexagon, you know everything. For example, the octagon, you glue two hexagons. Yes. And other objects, you glue more hexagons. And the, the claim is that this X again is like the fundamental object. Is you see from far away it looks like a triangle. Yes. And so this X again is like a triangulation of all these string interactions. And and that would be the hope is that this is true. So we have evidence that this is true that there is this fundamental object, out of which we can then glue it together. And depending on how we glue it, we get the various infinitely many correlation functions that you are referring to. The most trivial way of gluing it gives the octave. Other ways of gluing would give other things. In practice, it's not trivial to glue. Gluing things is not trivial. And uh, we did not manage to glue much more than the octagon. But that's uh, part of the things that we are working on. So right now, you do not know the hexagon? We know. Oh, you do know. OK. I know. Yeah. But knowing the, the, the hexagon, so there are two. There are, uh, uh, Two key steps: one, fixing this building block, and two, learning how to put uh, how to put many hexagons together. For okay. example, in this case, two of them. Right. So, what does it mean to put things together in physics? It means you insert a resolution of the identity, right? So you resolve the identity and you sum over things that are in in the gluing between two things, right? And so we know the hexagon, but the identity means all possible states along the gluing lines. We also know them. But then we are dealing with infinite sums about all these resolutions of the identity. So quickly, the quantities become very involved. If you have to glue many hexagons, at each line where you glue them, you have an infinite sum of all possible states. And those infinite sums often are not tractable. And sometimes you can resum them. You can resum these infinite sums into some structure. So this determinant is an example. It's a way of encapsulating all this infinite sum into this single structure, this determinant. If I take this big determinant and expand it out, it's like undoing this exercise and going to this expansion of resolution of the identity. But nicely, it can be all collapsed and written in this very compact determinant form. And uh, so we know the infinite sums up in principle for any correlation function. But in usable form that we can really plot, we only know for the octagon. OK, yeah, thanks. I see. Uh, sorry, do you have operator that can constitute by other spin to like spin one half and one? 
Uh, the question is if we have spin one half, if we can have operators with spin one half. And also spin one, for example. Right. So, uh, so for spin one half, the answer is yes, and it's, it's quite simple. So let's suppose I consider Z, which is defined as phi one plus I phi two. And let's consider X, which is phi three plus I phi four. And now the claim is that this Z, I will think of it as spin up. And this X, I will think of it as spin down. And now I will consider operators that just have Z and X and they don't have, they don't use all the six scalars. They just use Z and X, right? So now I consider operators which are trace of Z, Z, X, Z, Z, Etc., which correspond in spin chain language to up, up, down, up, up, dot, dot, dot. Then uh, the claim is that the Hamiltonian gamma acting on these states that corresponds to some spin chain Hamiltonian acting here, right? That this Hamiltonian is an SU2 Hamiltonian. So why? It's trivial. It's just that the trace doesn't contribute. Right? The trace gives zero. Why? Because we already saw that trace acting on Z and Z gives zero. And on Z and X, it's obvious that it gives zero because they don't share any scalars. And so acting on this subsector, this Hamiltonian is just the sum of identity minus permutation, which you can write as a sum of some constant times spin at position i dotted with spin at position i plus one. So it is just the usual Eisenberg Hamilton. Uh, spin one, uh, no, this is spin one half. Spin one would be harder to consider. Uh, you could engineer uh, something, but um, not exactly. So there is this famous spin one integrable Hamiltonian that uh, Babujan and others consider. This one does not come out naturally uh, here. Mm, so it seems like you don't consider the full super young meal in some no. sense, right? No, I don't think that implies that. And then you was talking about the richest no, no, string in I disagree. Do you agree that uh, your statement doesn't imply that? Why would, why would yeah yeah that? okay just asking <laughs> i don't think there's any relation mm -hmm. just the fact that the model of babujan doesn't show up doesn't mean anything about the idea so is your dual string theory is ambiguous the string theory in ads5 no it would be regular string theory uh, in ads5 just string theory but instead of in flat space it would be string theory in ads5 but the tension should be very large in some sense. No, the fact that you have uh, the string tension can be arbitrary. So when the string tension is large, it means that uh, string theory is easy. When string theory is finite, it, it means you have to do the, the exact quantum path integral. Like in the spin chain language, when lambda is small, it means the spin chain is easy. It's nearest neighbor. When the lambda is finite, I need to do all the quantum stuff and it's much more complicated. Okay, thank you. So because of these spin chains, but we always also also like, from my tensor network perspective, I always saw like uh, periodic matrix product states. Um, so so um, can one easily interpret, uh, or is there any reason why one cannot interpret it uh, in this way, or and have people considered um, a tensor network approach in this framework, or is it? Uh, yes, there are papers about using tensor pro uh, tensor matrix product states and. Uh, uh, in this context. So, and they show up in two, two places. So one is there are some simple matrix product states that describe some simple states here. And they are really usual matrix product states. You just uh, write the usual MPS and uh, they will correspond to some particular states. So that's a direct connection. So there are states, there are operators that take the form of a matrix product state. 
the other connection that is more indirect would be through bit and zats. There is a construction of bit and zats that's called the algebraic bit and zats that is a tensor network, but it's not a meta or it's not a one with a standard topology. It's more, uh, it reminds more of this tensor network and normalization topology. So, so that is a more indirect connection. It's not really, yeah, depends on the taste of the person. I mean, I, I like to think that it's like a tensor network, but uh, you don't need to. And uh, well, this is integrable, so you actually don't, don't need uh, this picture. But um, is there any, uh, are there maybe also non integrable th theories where this tensor network could provide an ansatz to contribute some, something in this? Uh, Right. So, um, I, I think it depends on the type of question we are asking. So, for some questions, clearly it will be overkill, right? Because if you are interested in that, I want to compute the one loop dimension of the smallest operators of my theory, the simplest ones. Okay, then the Hamiltonian is... Uh, finite, it's relatively small. Okay, you can just diagonalize it uh, by direct diagonalization, by brute force, right? If you have a spin chain of length four or five or six, you don't, you are not going to use any technique, right? Now, you could ask, well, but I want some long spin chains in particular because I'm interested in some coarse grain picture where this long spin chain becomes effectively continuous and so on. And for some reasons, I might want to consider big operators with some spins changing slowly along the spin chain. Then I might want to use some methods of like some tensor networks to describe this mixed spin chain. Then uh, indeed you could, let's stop chat. Indeed you could do that, but uh, then uh, you would be doing it uh, say at one loop when you would compute the Hamiltonian and you would know the Hamiltonian. But a priori, what you would like to do is to do it uh, beyond one loop, to do it at any number of loops. In particular, if you want to see the string, you need to resend it. And then if the theory is not integrable, you have very little hope of knowing this Hamiltonian because you would have to do these Feynman diagrams. And uh, beyond one loop, at one loop, you can do any Feynman diagram you want. And you just, instead of getting one minus two, you will get one minus three. And then you can use some tensor networks to study the case with one minus three. But then if you want to do two loops, four loops, five loops, and so on, if you don't have integrability that, and what integrability will manifest itself into some pattern emerging that you can guess the general result, you have no hope of studying finite coupling. So, so it depends. Uh, so if there is a way of computing this Hamiltonian through some method, then you can indeed study it through some tensor network. But typically, the way to compute the Hamiltonian is doing some Feynman diagrams. And, and it, when the theory is not integrable, you will find the manifestation of that complication as the Feynman diagrams becoming very complicated. You could flip it around and say, I define my gauge theory through giving an Hamiltonian. I forget about Lagrangians. I don't care about Lagrangians, right? After all, we don't measure Lagrangians. So I will define quantum field theory. I will define holography through something else. I forget, I throw away the Lagrangian and say, well, let a quantum field theory be some, a bunch of spin chains with a bunch of rules for gluing these spin chains. Now, if you were to do that, to change paradigm and rethink quantum field theory in that way, then yes, then you could imagine developing setups where you start using matrix product states and you postulate spin chains and rules and so on. So that's something we would, very much love to do. But that, that's a very advanced question. Yeah. That, that's a, a tough thing, a tough one. Yeah. Uh, question? Mm -hmm. So uh, what's the uh, upshot of all this? Like. Uh, is it possible to make any sort of statement that, that um, is, quantum, is quantum gravity going to be an integrable theory at the end of the day? No, it's not. Because quantum gravity contains turbulence and turbulence is not integrable. Exactly, exactly. right. That's what I was thinking is that, right. So, 
So that's the shortcut. Yeah, but... So how do you reconcile this with what I'm saying? So there are different things you can ask about quantum gravity, right? So let's uh, maybe not say so fast. So there are, and there are many things you can do in quantum gravity, but there are two very different experiments you can do in quantum gravity. One is we can do scattering experiments. So that is a good observable in quantum gravity. I can go to the boundary of space time and send gravitons and receive them at plus infinity. So I can send gravitons from minus infinity, let them interact and receive them at plus infinity. How many gravitons? I don't know, let's say four gravitons in infinite past and six gravitons in infinite future. So a 10 graviton process in total. So this would be like considering a 10 point function. That type of process where I have a 10 point function of gravitons is dual in n equals four superior mills to a 10 point function of operators of the type I've been describing. Oh, that's doable. And there we do believe there is some integrability structure. Now, on another different question you can ask is about black hole physics. So suppose I have many gravitons, not 10, but a gazillion of them that form a black hole and a coherent state and so on. Then you are not describing a, a single string topology. You are describing an infinite sum over many, many a coherent state of many, many strings. And there I believe you lose integrability. So the claim would be that the hope, the best hope we can get, I, we can imagine, we can hope for, I think, is that you would get integrability for each fixed string topology. But if you need to, but it would be in the sum over string topologies and so on that an integrability would kick in. So, so you would, so you, 10 would you would have both. There would be integrability. 12 gravitons, there would be integrability. 14 as well. Of course, more and more complicated. But the infinite sum would not be integrable. The infinite sum would be non integrable. So the model that governs the infinite sum to get some, to some black hole physics or to some coherent state physics, that, that's where the, the non integrability would kick in. So, you know, I mean, so. Geometry would be integrable at a microscopic level, but at a macroscopic level, the, the non-integrable. The string geometry, the string geometry, the two-dimensional string geometry, yes. The higher mm -hmm. dimensional target space geometry, no. Right. I think of the parallel bit to, uh, you know, the fact that uh, one can have time reversal invariant laws uh, at a microscopic level, uh, but still, a macroscopic system can, um, you know, be uh, can preferred direction of time, right? Version direction of time from those microscopic time reversal invariant laws. So that's true. sort of like that. That uh, parallel comes to mind. I mean, I can say something simpler than that. So yeah, okay. No, I I, I want. To, uh, it's okay. Oh. No, thank you. This was a this was an amazing talk. No, thank you. Really liked it. Yeah. I'm happy. I, it, was, it was a fun discussion. Thank you for asking many questions, all of you. Yeah, thank you for this very nice uh, blackboard uh, presentation. It was very yeah helpful for understanding. And yeah, let's thank uh, Peter again. Yeah.